Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Louise Lavictoire, for those of you that don't know me, and I'm the Interim Head of Science at the FBA. So welcome to this uh, latest installment of the FBA seminar series, where we're exploring the careers to date of the FBA fellows and telling you a bit more about um, some of the key FBA projects. Um, we hope you're enjoyed, enjoying the seminar series so far. Uh, if you've missed any of the talks, they are all, are all available on the FDA website under the Discover and Learn tab. Uh, the presentations are all brought to you free of charge. So if you're enjoying the series and you're not already an FDA member, you can support us again through the website by uh, using the Join Us tab at fda.org.uk. So for today's seminar, I'd like to welcome Dr. Paul Raven. Paul joined the National Rivers Authority as head of Head Office Conservation Officer in 1991 and was Head of Conservation and Ecology at the Environment Agency from 1998 to 2011. He co-wrote Rivers and Natural and Not So Natural History with Nigel Holmes, which was published in 2014 as part of the acclaimed British Wildlife Collection series. He is currently an Associate Editor for Aquatic Conservation and he has uh, been an FBA member since 1985 and was a member of the FBA Council during 2002 to 2006. So warm welcome to you, Paul, and uh, take it away when you're ready. I'm gonna talk you through um, how the nature of rivers and lakes, a subtle change there, changed my life. And um, I hope it will give you a flavor of how um, my career or life <clears throat> evolved. And it's, and again, I'm going to make apologies. It goes back a long way. Um, and there's some fairly rudimentary primitive material, particularly in the first half. Um, but it gives an authentic throwback to the, uh, to the time when um, people didn't even uh, had um, a vague idea of computers, which I still have at the moment, as you, as you can, as you can uh, show. And I think one of the themes, there's a number of themes that are running through this, and one of them is actually being able to improvise and develop new methods. Patience, persistence, and luck come into everything. Um, and I'm sure you will, um, I'm sure everybody will sort of have a hint of, yes, that's happened to me. Um, but here we go. Um, we're, on, we're on the ride now. So I'm going to start at the beginning. And um, I was born in Isleworth in West London, but brought up. Um, a stone's throw from the foot of Glastonbury Tour and spent many hours exploring the Somerset levels um, on my bicycle. I can still remember pond dipping for invertebrates in the, uh, in the water star work. And Mr. Crane, who lived up the road, very appropriate name, took me fishing for dace, perch and roach down on the River Brew. Um, and even more appropriately, I fell in on one occasion in a, at a place called Plunging Drove. Uh, my mum wasn't too happy about that. Um, the school run for me was a bike ride across the, the, um, the Somerset Levels to Street. And my favourite subject at school was physical geography um, and particularly the patterns that rivers made. But you have to um, sort of fast forward to 1979 before I really got stuck into studying rivers in, in earnest. And before that, I'd done geology and geology at Reading, um, and I spent more time on, um, in, a, in a boat on the Thames than actually studying the river. I'd taken a year off to make some packing cases for um, pop group road um, crews. That was interesting. I completed an MSc at, um, in ecology at Aberdeen, and I'd done some short-term contract work for the Nature Conservancy Council, of which the cover um, shown is here. Um, nothing to do with rivers. It was the sand of Forvey um, Sand Dune Nature Reserve in the northeast of Scotland. And I also worked as an over, very overqualified um, handyman at the Marine Research Station at Torrey, um, cleaning out the experimental fish tanks. Um, but I also helped on experimental work with the scientists on cod vision um, and also tracking tagged salmon from a rubber boat as far out as the Bell Rock Lighthouse. And that was pretty exciting as well. So that was the interim. Um, 1979, I started an NERC case studentship um, PhD under Ted Hollis at the Geography Department, UCL. Um, Ted was a hydrologist, and, but he had very good contacts with Thames Water um, Authority, Lee Division, and they were, the, they were the industrial sponsors for the PhD. And it was um, their generous grant and a UCL bursary that helped me 
um, uh, fill the gap in grants because I'd already used up one year um, at, um, at Aberdeen. Now, the roading is a fairly sort of um, uh, typical clay river in, in Essex. And my task was to assess the ecological um, uh, effects of a novel flood, flood relief um, work that was going to go through that. Now, it's about 15 miles northeast of central London is the roading. Um, and when I got there, it was obvious you know, that this was going to be a fairly big work. But when you look back at the map um, here, um, you see the dotted lines on this. And again, this is for my thesis, so apologies for the rudimentary stuff. Uh, drawn by yours truly, that it had been realigned several times in the past. And this was really, um, and that straight bit was to accommodate the N11 in 1974. And it really sort of set the scene because uh, this was a time, getting to the end of the time of 50 year period between 1930 and 1980, when more than eight and a half thousand kilometers of main river in uh, England had been dredged Steetons and by drag lines and, um, and diggers. What Thames Water Lee Division were trying to do was try a pioneering um, attempt to minimize the damage, this dreadful damage that had been happening over the last 50 years. And this block diagram, which again is uh, drawn and retrocetted by myself in 19, <laughs> whenever you are, um, the novelty was to actually leave the dry weather channel, the bottom part of the channel intact and excavate laterally uh, and put the dredge spoil um, over to one side so that your flood conveyance was um, accommodated laterally rather than in a, in a sort of deep um, channel. And so that was the, it was a fairly sort of um, novel way of doing it. And the PhD was to see, see what happened basically. Um, the problem was when I arrived in London in July 1979, um, I was assuming I was going to have, um, you know, a reasonable amount of time on the, on the pre-work study. And then Ted told me that the figures were moving in the following week. So I, so I thought, yikes, um, had to don thigh waders and frantically go up to the site. Um, and it, I had to map the macrophytes um, on this three kilometer stretch. Um, and take some photographs with a departmental um, 35 mil slide transparency camera and just poof, they weren't overexposed. Um, so it was pretty frantic to begin with, but it wasn't quite as bad as that because the diggers are not going to sort of move in and do three kilometers overnight. So I, I managed to sort of over, over a few weeks, keep just ahead of the diggers as they moved upstream to downstream to do some uh, mapping in earnest to estimate cover abundance. This map here, or well, this was this um, this diagram here, shows the um, well, two things. The inset shows what I was doing. First of all, there weren't any at the time. There weren't any standard protocols for ma monitoring macrophytes in the channel or along the edge, and so I had to improvise. And I did the thirty meters um, of um, sections all the way down mapping physically mapping and actually getting in the river and estimating cover abundance. Um, so that was an improvisation to start off with. And for the waterside plants growing alongside the, the dry weather channel, all I did was I used the same 30 meter tape and I um, uh, pegged it in various places and recorded plants growing every four, uh, 0.4 meters along. Uh, the reason I selected 0.4 meters was it was the, I could account for individual clumps of plants. The problem was, and you can see this coming up, is three kilometers of uh, recording is 9,000 points, more than 9,000 points in all. Um, so that was going to, although it was um, heavy, it was going to be problematic when I was doing my re resurvey. That was a theme, too much data. <laughs> First thing. But it was interesting on this bit. The um, Thames Water Authority were monitoring um, their, their biologists and fisheries um, guys and girls were measuring the macroinvertebrates and fish. So I have concentrated uh, mainly on the, uh, the macrophytes and also the channel habitat and some incidental observations on riverbirds and, and dragonflies. Now this plot here is a um, shows you a longitudinal profile of the riverbed. Um, upstream to downstream, a uh, part of it. 
and you will see that um, the dotted line um, would have been what a, a traditional deepening and um, profile would have been on, 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 on a normal alleviation scheme. What this shows is that two years after um, the works had been completed, the um, riverbed was still intact, little triangles at the top where riffles um, um, were occurring. So that was a pretty good sign that um, things had actually worked out. The dotted lines, by the way, show where another slight um, problem um, happened over the first in the first winter. The problem was, and that problem was, that um, the topsoil that had been put on these um, lateral shelves, if you like, um, the grass seed hadn't um, grown in time before the first big winter spate came down. Typical clay river, big spates come in every now and again, and it washed all the topsoil away, which meant that the berm surface was up to a foot lower than, it sh than the design capacity. Um, and we'll see that. Um, that had problems, and um, this was actually, um, again, it's difficult to show, but the photograph in the bottom right-hand corner shows the impact of waterlogging instead of being dry, and uh, reed canary grass, Phalaris arundinacea, taking over and reducing the flood conveyance. So there was a, there was a problem there, but at least um, I was on hand to actually monitor that. The overall, um, the um, conclusions that I had come to um, from, from the whole point about this um, uh, PhD was there was minimal um, impact um, compared with uh, the traditional flood defense, but there were some design um, uh, features uh, which had to be considered, one of those being that the this lateral excavation should be at such a level that it wouldn't cause water logging and um, subsequent um, reed growth, because that would um, cut to flood conveyance. But also there was quite a bit of um, uh, excavation of, of, of um, banks with cliffs with uh, kingfisher in, and um, that was one of the impacts was that the kingfisher nesting sites um, still disappeared. So again, it could be tweaked. But at the end of the day, um, overall, um, it was um, judged a success, particularly in terms of this pioneering approach. Now, the next, the next um, um, issue or challenge or difficulty I had was, was at, um, my, at my, at my uh, Viva, Viva my, one of my external examiners was uh, Nigel Holmes. Uh, you'll be hearing about him much more. Um, later, but he just completed a national survey of macrophytes and derived the classification system for typing rivers. And um, he just couldn't understand why my data rich study, as you imagine, all those points and all the ran stratified random transects and things, contained so few probability and confidence calculations. Um, so I had to spend the next few months, three months, I think it was re-putting in all my data to the, uh, to the computer uh, and running mini tab analyses for virtually everything that moved in, in, in the data set. Um, so I couldn't move for printouts of Man, Whitney and, and uh, paired t-test results. But the thing about that which, that um, demonstrated um, to me was that essentially, and again, this was a theme that I started off, essentially I'd written the thesis even though I'd done the sort of the data collection as a field naturalist rather than um, essentially um, an ecological scientist. And that transformation was, um, was well, it's quite painful to start off with, but it was a, it was a major, a major um, issue. And it's um, taught me things that at least my papers were accepted for the Journal of Applied Ecology later. So I'm thankful for that, um, that um, <laughs> lesson. Um, bit of a change here. Um, my first publication was not in the PhD. Um, I noticed, and you will see in the top left hand um, picture, I noticed um, one of the banks that was due to be um, taken away had a kingfisher in it and there was slime coming out of it and I noticed bones in it and I thought, as an aside, hey, maybe I could um, uh, use that material, have a look at the bones and work out what the young king kingfishers have been eating. So in short, 
um, I dragged out all the slime and bones. And back in the laboratory, I discovered they were full of these throat bones. You can see that bottom left-hand corner, um, cyprinid fish have this for sort of um, mashing up um, their um, food material. They have them at the back of the, of the throat, head, what they call pharyngeal or throat bones. Um, so I measured those and I um, <clears throat> took a sample of live minnows and took the bones out of those to calibrate them. And it was a, it was a relatively simple calculation um, to um, plot the size and length of the bones, which you will see on the right hand side. Um, and the that was a nice satisfying um, bit. But another important lesson I had lesson I had um, when I was submitting that paper was that um, in those days, as you will, re will recall, you had to send off a manuscript, and it came back. Um, it came back where it was double spaced. I couldn't actually read anything of my original manuscript because Jeremy Greenwood, who's, who's the editor of Bird Study, had, had, had absolutely covered it in red ink um, and clearly demonstrated the difference between writing a, um, a thesis or, or a study and a scientific paper. And that really set me up again for my um, uh, writing career, actually made me realize the difference between the two. Well, whilst I was writing up my thesis, I was still at um, University College London, and um, Rick Batterby, um, who you will all know, <laughs> um, asked me, and I was an honorary research assistant at the time, to um, if I would like to help with the fantastic groundbreaking acid water work in the paleoecology research unit, um, and um, help, but also do some do some um, work. So I earned my keep help um, helping to. Uh, cart the boats and, and um, sediment cores and engines up in Dumfries and Galloway. And I was a bit, I would say, literally on the fringing of, the, of this work. Uh, while, the, while the flash guys were out doing their um, sediment coring work in the middle of the lake, I was trudging around the, uh, trudging around the edge, map, mapping literal uh, macrophytes and examining the strand line to see what's uh, what there. And the reason I was doing that, and again, it was thanks to Rick, was that in 1905, a, a guy called George West had visited um, the, all 33 lots that we, we went to and published a list in, the, in, in Edinburgh Transactions, Royal Edinburgh Society. Um, and I could actually do some tentative, very tentative comparisons between what he had seen, um, particularly when he had photographs in, in, the, uh, in, in the journal, and what I'd seen. Um, and that was basically uh, sow the seeds of a thought of how macrophytes could actually be used to um, assess changes in, in water quality uh, in relation to eutrophication and acidification. The standout um, uh, thing about that was I needed a boat really to go out and do the job properly. So uh, in the next couple of years, I, I had access to a small inflatable. And that allowed me to do some uh, proper um, sampling, um, transects with an Ekman grab and a, and a glass bottomed bucket um, to sort of go further offshore than just walking around, and also do the um, um, fairly destructive thing of double, uh, trawling a double headed rake through the sublittoral as well. And that had its moments because um, in imminent cat's eyes beckoned if you, if you were dragging along that and it suddenly caught a boulder. In uh, in one of those uh, in one of those lots, which is quite interesting. But the standout um, uh, finding top left um, was sphagnum growing in the sublittoral of several of these lakes, particularly Lock Fleet, um, um, beyond the usual uh, zonation of uh, shoreweed, uh, water lobelia, and um, uh, isoetes. And that was quite that was quite a surprise. Um, and on the right hand side. Um, Lock Fleet was a was a major project for the CGB funded project on experimental catchment liming, and the catchment was limed um, um, 1985 1986. And you will see from the right hand side that the amount of sphagnum auriculatum that was growing sublittorally um, disappeared quite rapidly. And it was interesting to compare sphagnum 
um, growing in, 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 in Scotland with um, that reported from Scandinavia and North America, where the sphagnum was actually encroaching from the side, whereas when I'd been walking around the lakes before, it wasn't obvious. So it, it was actually a different mode of, uh, of growth. Well, it was um, a fortuitous and albeit calamitous event for ecology that happened on the 5th of April, 1985 because a lorry carrying drums of um, powerful insecticide um, um, had a tire blowout on the M M11 and uh, spilt more than 500 liters of highly toxic um, chemical compound into um, the Brookhouse Brook, which just happened to be a tributary of the um, roading. Now that, that sounds familiar. Um, the red mark marks the spot where it happened, and the blue was my um, study area. And the chlorpyrifos wipes out arthropods and fish, and it killed everything from Abridge down to Barking Creek. Those of you who know EastEnders, that's where Barking Creek is. Um, and it was such a big event. It was the biggest event um, in Thames Water um, area history, and they were quite used to it quite regular sewage treatment um, uh, uh, overflows, um, that Dow Chemical, the, the chemical company, funded a two-year um, postdoc research at the Polytechnic of Central, um, Central London under Jenny George. So I started there. I think I might have been a shoo-in for the, um, for the, uh, for the uh, postdoc. I started there in November. Um, so that's six months after the event. But fortunately, there'd been quite a, well, obviously a lot of intensive um, uh, uh, monitoring of the residue and also um, um, the effects on the on the macroinvertebrates in the meantime. And just a couple of things that you need to know about chlorpyrifos: very um, powerful insecticide developed in the 1960s, um, designed specifically to stick or be persistent in sediment and plant surfaces um, for obvious reasons, but, but highly lethal um, to um, um, uh, aquatic life. And you will see from the graph on the right that it did maintain um, it did persist in the, in the sediment um, for a long time. Um, and the problem with um, floods coming down, which you will see in the, in the bottom part, that means just that's the, that's the sort of river flow. Every time a big spate came through, it resuspended the uh, material, and um, some toxic levels of chlorpyrifos were re, re um, uh, suspended. So it was a big deal, and they put put the money in um, for doing it. And the, and the good thing was that four PhD studies had already been carried out on that reach, um, um, inclu uh, including mine, and dealing with several things. So there was good ecological, ecotoxological um, information um, um, for me to do that. But the thing was that I was I was. This is where it comes back to novelty, um, this sort of career, career move here. I was encouraged to um, arrange, uh, assess a whole range of um, taxa. Um, and that may, meant learning new techniques and discovering the identification um, um, tribulations of some of West less well-known taxa. I mean, I had to, this was interesting, I had to do gas um, chromatography to identify residue levels in macroinvertebrates, and that was quite uh, quite a startling change to my normal field work. Um, I was growing bacterial cultures from sediment samples, and then I was having to identify the predominant diatom ciliate botifern ostracod found in a whole range of um, microhabitats. And all of that was new to me, and it was fantastic. Um, but I had to, you know, press on. I shouldn't be sidetracked like I was before with the kingfishers. But that again, just expanded my experience of methods and also um, the, the targets. Now this um, table, um, I don't want you to, obviously I don't, all you need to know is, the, is that top line basically. For the arthropods, this was the sort of um, major bellwether measure. Um, there were survivors and recolonizers and you could divide those into rapid, moderate and slow. The problem with the survivors was um, leeches and, and, and gastropods um, were, uh, weren't affected. Um, so when I was going down and taking my um, macroinvertebrate samples, 
it was absolutely covered, the, uh, putting them through the sieves, which you do for, for, for the sampling, covered in, in leeches, absolutely disgusting. Um, and picking them off um, after the end of the day was, uh, was a very tedious, very tedious business. Um, but it, there was an interesting um, response um, in terms of recolonization from um, those uh, um, other arthropods. Um, and those who are familiar with the, with the, with the Latin names will, will, will realize that. But I think the, the main message was that there, there was a differential recovery of um, these macroinvertebrates, uh, presumably due to invertebrate drift and, and, and adult um, recolonization as well. Um, at the end of the day, um, and again, this, this graph shows on the, on the left the number of um, um, invertebrate families on the right uh, BMWP score um, at various levels from the control site upstream um, right the way down to Ilford or Barking underneath. The main thing is, and the arrow shows where the um, spillage took place. So this is comparing um, before and after. The conclusion was that within two years of uh, the spillage, then um, the invertebrate, macro invertebrate fauna was almost back to normal. You could have said virtually back to normal. And that was the trigger, basically, for Thames Water Lee Division to restock the uh, roading uh, with, with coarse fish. It was, it was well known for chub and roach. And so those, if you remember back to the slide that I showed originally for my PhD with the anglers walking along, they'd been a bit hacked off for two years. So um, they were well pleased when the, um, when the fish went back in. So in that respect, a pretty satisfying um, time. Um, and there's, that, was, that was good. But there's no peace for the wicked, as they say. Um, and within three days of finishing that um, postdoc, I was flying to Belfast to um, start uh, a job in the Countryside and Wildlife Branch of the um, Department of Environment for Northern Ireland um, as a freshwater specialist. But my main job was coordinating the development and management plans for the 45 national nature reserves in the province. Um, but I couldn't get away from um, uh, the sort of uh, the UCL connection because well, I was taking leave to help out um, with a monitoring protocol and do some survey work on the UK acid water monitoring network in the 22 sites there. So um, I was I was getting I was still getting you know um, that as a, as, as another um, aspect of my career. Very enjoyable, but pretty busy. And then in 1991, um, the dream job came up, basically. This is the National Rivers Authority. I was appointed um, conservation officer um, in 1991. Um, and I won't bore you with the sort of the corporate stuff, but um, over the next 20 years, my head of profession and policy role evolved with the organization. And that went through quite a few changes head of conservation uh, and ecology, and, and eventually head of conservation, ecology, and marine, just to keep me busy. Um, and there was plenty of, plenty of um, influencing work to do, um, particularly in relation to Habitats Directive, UK Biodiversity Action Plan, um, and the forthcoming Water Framework Directive. Um, but I, want to, I, I don't want to concentrate on that bit. I want to concentrate on one aspect, um, which was a surprise when I arrived um, given this was the National Rivers Authority, I knew about I knew that um, the general quality assessment publications every five years was a brilliant piece of work based on the on the chemical and biological state of rivers um, uh, across the country. Um, there was a feeble attempt at immunity value based on the amount of litter on the tanks, and water abstraction was reported separately. But there was an embarrassing omission in relation to the physical character of rivers. And that was a pretty embarrassing permission for a national authority on rivers. So I thought, yeah, something needs to be done about this. Um, you can't just um, have um, pure clean water flowing around down a concrete pipe and calling it okay. Um, and there were plenty of um, ways of recording various aspects of rivers, the nature of rivers, the shape of rivers. Um, river corridor surveys, um, uh, were designed for mapping features that needed to be retained, maintained, or restored after enduring flood, flood alleviation works. I was very familiar with that. Um, perfect for restraining um, 
digger drive, enthusiastic digger drivers, but you couldn't in, um, evaluate the um, national state of rivers on that basis. Then we had fisheries had have score for classifying um, uh, sound modded rivers, which was good for that particular purpose. And there was the impressive rift packs stuff, which John Murray, John Murray Blythe did a brilliant uh, talk on that uh, for macroinvertebrates. Um, so basically, there were some common themes there, but but nothing <clears throat> that could actually produce what, what what was actually needed. So um, one of my first tasks, I commissioned the IFE Institute of Freshwater Ecology to identify the common features and to see if aerial photography, which was another one of my sort of childhood and uh, undergraduate interests, could actually provide the basis for a strategic overview of river corridors so that we could then report it. Um, and the conclusion, and remember, this is back in 1991-92, the conclusion at the time was that aerial photography could pick up a lot of the key habitat features, except where trees obscured the view. Um, but the cost of commissioning at that time, a national um, set of aerial photographs at the required scale, um, creating a, da a data archiving facility and the time needed to interpret and process of results just prohibited. So we were back to a field-based method um, with real people um, that would meet the objective um, because the danger was just developing a very expensive way of collecting useless information. Um, and so we needed a we needed this field survey protocol, which was simple to apply, um, was consistent and repeatable, um, was a valid representation of the physical characters of survey reach, and very importantly, it was ecologically and statistically sound, and uh, with my director breathing down my neck, cost effective. Um, so we had a small in, um, internal team to derive, test, and finalize such a method, and this was overseen by a um, a very um, high high uh, profile um, project board. And I and I selected it from a, from a various um, parts of the country and various disciplines, and I can assure you that there was some uncompromising and very uncomfortable cross examination of the uh, material that was coming in from the team, um, um, because it you know it was it was novel and contentious, um, but the team, which is mainly uh, Peter Fox, Mark Nor, and Helena Parsons, were equal to the task um, uh, uh, for developing this method, the sampling strategy, the computer database, and the training program. And it's no small feat indeed, and a, a fantastic, fantastic um, job. Now, one of, the, one of my other um, sort of influencing roles was to actually make um, this sort of uh, project board um, and want people to, to actually come to it. So I broke a few or bent a few rules in terms of um, accommodation and uh, identified um, pleasant venues, uh, one particularly in mid Wales, um, which also had a river, <clears throat> the River Irfan at the bottom that we could actually test material. Um, it had good food, good wine, and um, and a butler as well, which, which all these providers had extra incentive for um, some top top quality people to come to have the debate and then relax afterwards. And there you can see on the right. Um, after and it was pretty tough. Some of those, um, some of those uh, cross examinations, um, we relaxed um, with some dreadful games of pool. Apart from Phil Boone was usually the champion um, in the evening. So that was um, that. And the other thing that, again, a, a theme um, that I that I sort of um, you know, promote is that if you're going to do a job, do it properly. Get the right, get the best people um, attracted, and then publish it as well. Um, with a specific peer review, because there's no point in doing something without the peer review and publishing. Um, and so we had, um, through, through, through Phil, um, aquatic conservation um, special issue in 1998, and we had some follow-up ones in 2002 and 2010, which um, wasn't just on the River Habitat Survey, but just um, classification in, in general. So I thought that was very important um, to actually do that. So um, the Environment Agency funded publication of that. So we're putting our money where our mouth uh, works. And I think the key um, um, points that came out of how to sort of combine and do a 
do a thing properly, um, um, and the development team tested it to destruction, um, and then had to reinvent it and destruct it and uh, destroy it again, was the importance of a standard survey length and a codified systematic way of, of recording things. It was uh, one of the one of the shocking um, <clears throat> initial results that came out of um, the prototype was that it was very difficult for people to estimate cover abundance of uh, or abundance of, of different substrate types, macrophytes, etc., over anything more than about 10 meters. Um, so we stuck to a very stringent transect spot check and a, and a, and a sweep up summary over the 500 meter standard. And all this, all this um, derivation is written up in um, those aquatic conservation um, publications, those journals. The other key thing was a very comprehensive uh, guidance manual and prompt sheet for, for people in the field. Training is absolutely essential. Um, with accreditation needed, um, and also two-way feedback um, to improve both the method and also the, import the importance of individual surveyors, um, and double entry and quality um, controls for data input to the computer. Um, and so if that, that was, there's a whole load of stuff there that was, again, a, a big learning process. And it took three years, really, from, from scratch um, to get the system anywhere near right. It's, it wasn't perfect, obviously, because it was um, there for continuous improvement. Um, and the, the overall aspect in terms of how you describe character in terms of modification, artificial modification um, and quality was based on the data, not um, opinion in the field. And the result from, the, um, from, from this was um, the next thing with the method <clears throat> nailed-ish, um, was to actually get the baseline reference um, uh, sites sorted out. So we had a stratified random sample of uh, streams and rivers right the way across the UK, slightly different densities per 10k square in Scotland um, and Northern Ireland, but without a statistically uh, sound um, ref uh, baseline set, um, any comparison um, would, would not be statistically um, uh, uh, valid. So we, we, we published um, the results from this um, baseline survey, which was carried out by accredited surveyors from the NRA and um, IFE and other um, organizations. Um, and this was the report published in 1998. And the amazing thing there was that um, it was signed off. I would got um, the environment ministers from England and the newly devolved organisations in Scotland, Wales, and uh, Northern Ireland to sign it off without a, without a whimper. I said, "Yeah, good. You know, here's my signature." The uh, the slightly bizarre thing was I was actually summoned in person politely to the Manx capital, Douglas, um, to reassure the minister there in person that the Isle of Man would get a specific mention. And that's hence the um, the slightly longer title than we were anticipating. <laughs> but it was good. We were getting some profile. Um, and the um, unsurprising standout um, result was the rarity of what you would call near natural um, rivers because of the historical um, modifications, both in uplands and lowlands, but particularly the lowlands. Um, and that was confirmed by a second, the second. Um, a repeat survey, which did slightly different um, random random stratification, um, and that was carried out in two thousand and seven eight in England and Wales only. There's a lot going on, um, and again, you've got to bear in mind that I was still I, my my day job was still there, but I was I was hanging on, clinging on to my technical roots, um, you know, um, as, a, as a as a sort of field field um, ecologist. And one of the perks of this was that we had to calibrate the habitat quality um, assessment that we were doing by dragging ourselves to some really nice sites across the UK to get the top quality um, aspects. And that involved um, Nigel Holmes, um, Hugh Dawson, and me, usually, um, going in, um, in, a small, in a small group. And so on the left, we've got um, a nice lowland meandering stream in the New Forest. Um, but again, on the right, um, this was 
the site we that Hugh, Nigel, and I were at in a snowstorm. Um, it passed through by the time this picture was taken, luckily, when the River Habitat Quality Report was, was published. And this was 4,000 feet up um, in the Cairngorms. And um, it just shows you that meandering rivers don't occur in the lowlands um, uh, all the time. It's, uh, there's a classic quote from Mike Clark, actually, in one of the, in one of the uh, project board meetings when someone was wishing on about um, how you could actually predict what features were there from altitude. And, and he said, but rivers don't know how high they are. And that was a brilliant quote because the meandering is related to um, stream power and, 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 and gradient, not altitude. So that was um, one of the perks. The other thing that happened, um, and again, edu the education aspect of um, rivers and understanding rivers is very, very uh, dear to my heart. The project board um, agreed that an educational product would be a good idea. And so we, um, we teamed up with um, Ordnance Survey to produce um, uh, an educational CD-ROM. Um, this was specially tailored for um, the national curriculum, nine to 14 year olds in England and Wales. Um, and it contained a much simpler, slimmed down version of the method and the database. Um, it had a GIS capacity linked photographs and it had five educational mo modules. So it was pretty, uh, for the time, and it was launched in 2000, was pretty well um, um, ahead of its time. In fact, it was almost better than the um, um, Environment Agency database trials. Um, it was distributed um, free to every primary school in England and Wales. Um, and it was uh, also um, used abroad. It was it's from the 37 countries where they use it not just for rivers, but the the, um, the English glossary is, is very helpful as well. Um, the left-hand picture at the bottom shows um, uh, on the, the, the chap in the glasses was the chairman of the Environment Agency, um, John Harmon at the time, and, and Ed Garner has, uh, to his left, probably wondering how much this cost. <laughs> but it was one, one other thing, it was very satisfying um, uh, to, to do. The other thing that, um, again, it's, it was me being able to influence um, what I was doing in my holidays mainly, um, was that we'd done the benchmarking in the UK and it was very, very difficult to find um, uh, really top quality sites. So um, Nigel, uh, Hugh and I decided that it would be a good idea to try um, to go onto mainland Europe to see, to see if, the, if the method um, could be applied to similar um, sized rivers. In, uh, in in Europe, and so we we over over a few years we almost did a sort of transect from south uh, southern Portugal up to uh, up to up to Norway, um, visiting um, uh, particular sites um, where the um, hosts the um, were, were keen to actually carry on um, and compare notes because the, um, like us they were preparing for the water framework directive and they wanted to they knew that the hydromorphology stuff. Um, was coming along. Part of the we we also used it as a sort of calibration exercise, comparing methods um, that had been developed in France and Germany um, to compare results. Um, and this started development of the first European guidance standard for hydromorphology, which um, which which Phil Boone was 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 in charge of. And one of the key things and key differences between what we've done in terms of data driven rather than opinion driven. Um, field work was um, uh, the fact that ours was repeatable. Um, the French and German system at the time um, relied on uh, field surveyors making subjective judgments on quality of the field, um, you know, obviously backed up by photographs, but it was just not repeatable. So I'm afraid they would have failed virtually every one of our criteria that we set out at the start. But things have moved on since then. Um, um, and everybody had the same objective, which was to uh, protect the best sites and improve the ones that had been damaged. We, um, it wasn't just a sort of jolly, um, it was pretty, um, quite, quite tiring. And we actually did a report for each of the, uh, each of the countries we, we, we did. Um, with Nigel completing the macrophyte surveys, it was actually quite a good baseline for, for um, the countries that we went um, to visit. Um, and identify different types of rivers and different features. Um, Slovenia, Portugal, Slovakia shown on screen. 
um, but we had uh, um, Spain um, and Poland uh, in particular. And there were features. Um, we were getting to know the, uh, the, the, the locals. I'm afraid that's, uh, that shows um, Hugh, uh, Nigel and me when we were much, young, much younger in Poland. And one of the features um, that we came across, um, which is probably now appearing in, in, in parts of the UK now, um, 15 years later, was, um, was were, were beaver dams. So again, there were lots of little tiny features that, um, that could be adapted for um, uh, their, their version of, 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 of doing this. And um, this is a picture of a pole with pole, uh, um, some poles with poles. Um, one of the other aspects about um, the RHS method was the, the novelty of actually having to use ranging poles for, for various things, um, including substrate determination and health and safety. Um, the poles took to um, this kind of method or the or modification of it very, very seriously indeed. And we spent several years um, helping out with training there. And um, the, on the, the picture on the right is the Polish version of their, of, of, of their method uh, at the time. So that was um, that was good, um, and then um, there's a, a, another change in 2011. Um, the austerity cuts had led to um, quite a bit of um, significant job um, cuts in the Environment Agency, and my job was um, amalgamated with head of fisheries, so I took early retirement. Um, but I had plenty of ideas, um, uh, including writing a book. But Nigel Holmes had an even better idea. He said, I've been commissioned to write a book for the British Wildlife Series, and I'd like you to be co-author. Um, and the timing couldn't have been better, to be quite honest. Um, and our theme, a natural and not so natural history, were absolutely, you know, I sort of encapsulated what um, jointly we'd been doing over, 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 over the previous 20, 25 years. Um, natural and human change in, in intervention since the last ice age. Um, and um, it was embarrassing how much, once I started, Nigel gave me free reign to do the historical stuff. And I started going into the literature and finding out all sorts of new things. It was embarrassing having been head of, you know, conservation for rivers in, in England and, and, and Wales for the agency. Um, there was some really embarrassing stuff that I um, hadn't known about and it was a whole new journey. So the book to me was actually me going and learning and, and actually sort of um, being able to then um, write it all down. And two things really struck me, um, real standout stuff, um, was the, the, the history, the sort of the Ice Age history, and when I say Ice Age, over the million years, not just the last um, advance, of rivers in, in, in Northern Europe and how the Rhine and the Elbe had been diverted southwest to form a great big channel river which um, gouged out a huge valley, which is now the uh, which is now the English Channel, it's the size of the Congo. Apparently, all the reconstructions um, uh, suggest, and that had a huge impact on the um, the return of um, freshwater rivers um, fish species, which had obviously had to take refuge southeast um, as as the ice had advanced. Um, some the quicker returners, a bit like the invertebrates on the roading, um, managed to get back. Um, but the cha the channel, as the Channel River was was flooded with, with the rising sea levels, um, several um, cyprinid species um, just were, were, were cut off, basically. And that's explaining why the, the fish um, fauna of the British Isles um, is, is, is that how it is. So that was, that was a, um, quite, a, quite a, a, a very, very interesting thing. Now, seeing that was, I was retired, I could spend time going into the detail. The other thing was actually the, the amount of modification that had happened um, in, particularly in medieval times with realignments um, and later with fish weirs um, and mills. And it just basically um, encapsulated the immense knowledge that, that we could actually sort of collectively uh, transmit in the book, the historical as well as contemporary aspects. Um, and it also um, provided fantastic context of, of previous landscapes being modified in relation to the 20th century destruction from flood um, works that was the, was the um, backdrop to my PhD 
um, in 1979. And it was a fitting legacy, I think, for um, all this information to appear in a book because um, within six weeks of publication, Nigel suddenly died and he was on the river back. It came as a big shock. But at least the book had been done, so it's a fantastic legacy. Now, it's confession time as we're getting towards the end. Um, that after the book, um, and I had lots of ideas about doing um, river studies, my local river, I could do that. But in the end, I reverted to being a field naturalist, and I've been doing some work on um, uh, singing warblers on my bicy bi bicycle ride um, uh, in, 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 South, in South Gloucestershire. Um, so I've got um, quite a bit of data and quite a bit of um, uh, statistical analysis done by um, Ian Vaughan at Cardiff to actually um, produce. And also, um, um, tracking, I can track individual um, silver wash artillery butterflies because I've found out that each one has got a unique um, pattern of wing marking. So those two things have sort of um, been uh, fairly uh, um, prominent over, over the years. I, but I've, I've got back into the um, the fresh water bits. I've always never been away um, because, as um, Louise mentioned in the introduction, um, last year I took on um, associate editorship of Aquatic Conservation. Um, uh, um, Phil's the chief editor there, so um, I persuaded myself that um, actually it would it would um, make a good sort of bookend to my career, getting back into a sort of much more international flavour on. Um, for aquatic conservation. And my final slide is the same as the first one, which is basically a, re a, re a reflection of a very um, varied um, career um, of which I was extremely fortunate to be in the, in the position of being able to influence what I was able to do um, and keep my field survey route right the way through, which I think is probably unique in terms of the corporate um, stuff that we were we were meant to be dealing with um, on that basis, um, and I've, and also a reflection really because this is this is a this is a slide not taken by digital camera. What we would have done differently with in the in the land of GPS, laptops, mobile phone cameras, drones, and super fast computers, and what we might have done differently. And you know, it's it's just a reflection, but it's a rhetorical thing. There's no point in sort of thinking about that. Um, and finally, absolutely grateful for the fantastically uh, talented people in my teams, um, uh, who I was putatively in charge of because they were so good they could do it themselves, um, which kept the day job on the road and allowed me um, to keep touch with the, the field naturalist roots. Um, it's been hard work at times, but it's been great fun as well. And I hope the people who have been involved have enjoyed it as well. Thank you. That's great, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, we've had a couple of people dip out, but we do still have, I think most, mostly everybody's still here. We do have a couple of questions if everybody wants to stick around for those. So, Richard, you've got a couple of questions that you wanted to ask. Well, there's no sense. Can you hear me all right? Yep, got you. See, I don't know what the first question was. So I'll have to... <laughs> <laughs> it was about Gamerous. It was, yes. Paul, Gamerous Sanakai found so one of the survivors after that uh, massive pollution of the roading. I'm assuming that was down the bottom end. Yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. What, one of the things um, that I failed to um, um, do because it was too, it was um, <laughs> was um, part of the sampling was down in the intertidal. So yes. yeah, it, that, yeah, absolutely. I, that's that's a that's a good a detailed question, and I hope the response is uh, is satisfactory. Yeah, it, it's so difficult to actually do something. Uh, to get a general message, and then um, there's obviously going to be some sort of outliers <laughs> there. Yeah, <laughs> especially that, when you got when you got people being anal like me. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> you, you have to you have to withstand the scrutiny, and uh, <laughs> absolutely, course. you have to be prepared. No, that was down in East Endersville, um, down at Barton Creek. Right. Okay, that's interesting because I, I've always had the impression that cameras Pulex are far more susceptible to side pollution than gamma sadakai are and that seems to prove it yeah yeah it, yes i mean there was lots of lots of detailed stuff that came out of, of that and i didn't go into the i mean i could have done a 45 minute um 
seminar on the on on on, on the recovery. But um, yeah, the ecotoxicology was very interesting on that. Yep. Super. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Well, it's good to see you. You too. Richard, did you also want to ask about River Habitat Survey and reaccreditation? Yeah. It's slightly contentious. Um, we're in a position now, partly because of COVID, where people who have actually done the, the um, accreditation of, of RHS yeah. um, some time ago yeah. haven't been able to refresh. Yeah. I'm apparently in all right because I'm a sufficient sort of short time between my doing the refreshing and 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 COVID, yeah. That they're happy for me to, to carry on being accredited. But one of my staff has been in and out of of, of um, child care issues and 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 maternity leave, and has been told in order to, to retain her accreditation, she's got to redo the entire week. And and then do the exam and just doing a refresher isn't good enough. No, well, I, I mean, I, I mean, I can't comment on the basis that you know this is an EA policy issue. Mm. And if, I tell you, if I if if um, if, <laughs> if we turn the clock back, it seems daft because a refresher is a refresher. Yep. Um, and uh, I, I I think as long as you keep the quality control and the uh, keep track on on um, any slight. Um, uncertainties that the individual surveyors have, um, that 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 I, I would have hoped that, that would be good enough, um, particularly on on the, in relation to having to go through the whole week again, uh, would seem would seem pointless to me. But that's a personal view. Um, um, you can understand, and yeah. Of course. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I will. I will make a bit of a fuss. I think. Okay. Well, I think you should. <laughs> Well, it, it will end up with only me being the RHS surveyor, and I'm at my desk most of the time now. Yeah, no. so it just won't get used. But it's hopeless, isn't it? No, there's got to, there's got to be a way forward on that one. Definitely, I think so. common sense. I think so. Thank you. Paul. If anybody else has any questions for Paul, then please feel free to unmute yourself and ask those. I'm aware that people might want to come up and get lunch, but if anybody else has any questions, we can hang on for another few minutes. Ed. Uh, hi, Paul, Rick. Um, Rick. Hi, wonderful talk. Thanks very much. And thanks for uh, the shout out at the beginning there on the acid rain stuff. Um, <laughs> oh, just, just thinking about the uh, advantage you took of the West survey back in the day. Yeah. Um, to what extent have you uh, archived material? Um, or, or encouraged archiving of material in a similar way uh, so that people in 50 years' time will be able to make some comparisons between oh. macrophytes today and in the future. Yeah, well, this was, this was one of the um, other, other sort of themes, um, and, it, and it, it relates back to sort of Nigel's work. I, I, I've st I mean, in fact, I was up in the loft yesterday, and I was going through, and I've still got the voucher specimens for the, for the mosses. Up in, up, it's, all, it's all stored, and I think um, this sort of storage facility of voucher specimens. Um, I've got them. Nigel Holmes had them. Um, that's been, you know, donated to the FBA. And it's an absolutely essential um, aspect of baseline um, material that can then be used in future. Um, so yes, I would encourage that. And I think it ought to be a theme of the FBA's, you know, scientific um, uh, discipline, basically, for, for promoting um, um, far and wide. Um, and and, and the, I, the, the the thing the only archiving part of the of the of the West stuff was the sort of the photographs and the lists, but I think um, you know the, all the effort about getting to the getting to the site um, would be um, uh, well part of that would be lost if you didn't actually then archive and venture the specimen that you that you collect. I I mean, it's, yeah, fantastic. We've still got the um, acid waters vouchers. I think. Yes. Make absolutely yes. sure that they're actually safe for uh, for posterity. So yeah, precisely. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. and and the other thing that's linked with the macrophytes, of course, is and that's a few diatomists have, have done this in the past. Is that uh, those people who've collected macrophytes have also inadvertently been collecting. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, the yeah. And, uh, <laughs> a lot of value has come from that. Yeah. 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 Y
yeah absolutely yeah and 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 uh yeah i i'm, I'm a great sort of uh, believer in archiving if, it, if you're going to go somewhere remote go there once and do it properly and then you can then someone else can go back in 50 years time but don't go up and then come back semi-empty handed thanks John, would you like to ask a question? Oh, hi, hi, hi there. Yeah, um, uh, I, I, at the end, you, you, on your, on your last slide, you sort of pointed towards the future, and I was wondering if you were able to do one more job, what would it be? Um, <laughs> wow, that's a very good question, John. <clears throat> you know, you're setting me up for something. Uh, no, no, I was just wondering. I thought you were going to mention yeah. it on the last slide. No, no, no. Um, if you're starting now, you'd do things differently, or you'd say. No, I, 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 going back to the, going back to, you know, there's, there's a lot of unfinished business. Well, I mean, there always is in science. It's always unfinished. This is always new things. But I think the, the, the thing that's, that's irritated me over the years, um, and still irritating, is the fact that, um, the education system coming up from sort of primaries right through sort of um, secondary and even tertiary um, is being shortchanged on the value um, um, of rivers uh, in relation to just their, um, you know, uh, innate um, value as well as ecosystem services and, and climate change and stuff. And I'm, I still think there's a job to be done to actually improve the understanding of British rivers for, uh, for UK um, um, ed, ed, you know, educators, um, because it's still, it's still, it's still cursory. It's still based on American uh, river type theories and stuff. And I think it, it's just a, you know, it's a personal view. But it's a, I've, it's a, it's been a, um, you know, bug for me. For, that's why we did Riverside Explorer to try and get that. Because if you can get just a few people understanding um, the nature of British rivers and how they've changed and how you can work with them and re restore them. That feeds through into the sort of engineers <clears throat> and the ecologists in universities, and that feeds into, you know, um, the agencies that, that do it. But I think that I think they're being shortchanged. They're they're um, they're being. <sighs> it, it, so if there's one more job to do, I would I would refresh or re-energize the educational aspects of using the huge amount of data and knowledge that we accumulated collectively, including the FBA, obviously, over 50 years and, and funneling that into something um, that would appeal, not just to um, um, school teachers and school kids, but also the general public. Because we, what we need is, and I've said it many times and other people have said it, we need a David Attenborough version of uh, freshwater ecology um, to sort of really sort of ignite some of the stuff mm. and people will understand. So, you know, when a flood comes, people will understand you know the reasons for it and how you can actually um, mitigate it and ameliorate it in the future by understanding the rivers rather than just oh let's you know knee jerk reaction. So that's a it's the sort of education in the broadest sense. But we have I think with that massive amount of say data and knowledge we've got, I don't think we're quite using it. So that that would be that would be a job for me or someone else that I could I could um, <laughs> I could nag. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, was the, great... there was the watch series, um, the watch groups. I think there were four work packages, folders, well produced, that preceded Riverside Explorer. But yeah, I, I haven't seen anything similar since. Yeah. Maybe that's something we can think of in FBA. Well, I was, I was, I, you know, someone's got to do it. Um, and it, it's basically the trigger and the influence to get someone who's got the time. And the energy and the money to actually do it, and I'm I'm sure because I was thinking someone like Google, um, um, with access to the huge information and data collection services. I mean, um, you know what, what I would do. So I was doing Riverside Explorer, Explorer again from scratch. I'd I'd get someone like Google on board very mm. early on um, because they're huge um, um, in terms of in terms of data transfer both ways. Um, and they've got the money now, um, so I would, I would, I would get into that. Um, you know, think, think big in terms of um, who can actually sort of transform the, the way we work. I just wanted to add 
to to Rick's point about archiving and mm -hmm. saving specimens, uh, as universities get more and more squeezed for space and for money, uh, Hilla, my wife Hillary and I decided to to give all our, our large collection of mosses and liverworts and so on to Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh. Yeah. So I was sad to, 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 to say goodbye to it. It's absolutely wonderful that A, the stuff is being used. Yeah. Uh, new things that we misidentified. <laughs> yes. It turned out one of, from your last picture, the moss we collected quite near there turned out actually to be new to the British Isles. Uh, so I, I really do, you know, although I'm in the university, I see a herbarium having little chance of survival, that really places like the British Museum or Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh they really have a key role yeah. in keeping <clears throat> safe. Absolutely. No, I it's couldn't shame in, in the case of the West thing that some of those, as you know, macrophytes are quite critical and, and there, there aren't in fact that for specimens. Yeah, no, it's it is absolutely critical. Um, and one one of the things that I, I know that Malcolm Newson was um, decrying was the fact that the hydrological records from uh, from Plim Limum, the whole of those just went in the skip uh, twenty years ago, and it's I mean it's incredible how short sighted. Um, and again, it's it's <laughs> I go back to my point that the people who make those decisions probably aren't aware of what they're doing, and if they had been made aware of the importance of all the sort of disciplines, including archive, uh, when they when we when they were younger, it would actually in, entrain a, a a thought process, mm -hmm. so that they would actually say, "Well, hang on a minute, that is that's worth keeping because you know if we're going to adapt, mitigate um, future changes, we need to we the past is the key to the present and the future, and it's um, absolutely fundamental. And, and again, it's a space it's a space problem." isn't it? And, there, and there will come a point where, yeah, um, you know, it's, it's quite ironic that, you know, you see all, you're just driving along the, uh, the motorway, you see all these huge distribution centers that are being built by Amazon and, um, and Google and various other things. They're huge. I mean, some of these are about three quarters of a mile long, um, just for storing and, and redistributing goods. And yet the scientific, Aspects of um, you know sort of vouchers and museums that are being squeezed. Yeah. So um, again, I think I think you know a bit of lateral thinking and, and um, getting getting uh, someone like Google to actually allocate a bit, of, <laughs> a bit of space, and it comes down to space um, for archiving would be absolutely fun fundamental. If they could archive and redistribute data, uh, useful data as well as just goods, which they make money out, that would be that would be fantastic. But I'm just thinking, I'm just laterally thinking, talking rubbish, but. Um, you know, I think you. I think these days you have to think. Um, you know, completely new thoughts, because yeah. if you don't, then things will disappear. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's an extinction of data rather than an extinction of species. I mean, that's another, 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 <laughs> and, and, the, and the consequences of that are fundamental. Well, I go one. I go one stage further, and that although now, now that. that <clears throat> There are so many databases. The, the assumption is that all the data in the databases are correct. <laughs> yes. And that the original specimens are no longer kept. You know, so it's a, you know, certainly in the case of pollen, people tend to think that, you know, once my data are in the pollen database, then I don't need to keep the slides, or even people no longer mm -hmm. keep their count sheets. You know, yeah. so it's, it, it, it's, as you say, it's a storage problem, and it says, you know, people need to think ahead. Yeah. So, Paul, to... could I could I make a comment, Paul? Um, sorry, yeah. I'm not on video because my internet's playing up. It's Bill Briney. Um, All right, Bill. I don't know. Hi, Paul, um, and everyone. I, I don't know whether you recall, but sort of coming out of the work that Anne Powell did with Freshwater Life back in the day, and came the, the digital archive, which the FBA developed <clears> with um, funded, well, it was a long-term project, but ended up with funding from DEFRA as part of the, the demonstration test catchments. 
which yeah. was a secure archive for data uh, and information of all sites from spreadsheets and databases to photos and documents and things. The trouble is with that, it, it, and, and I agree with you totally, we, we just must do that and it shouldn't be left in spreadsheets or databases which will go out of date. It needs to be secured and, and in lots of different ways and data standards and all of those things. But the problem is that we, once the contract had finished, DEFRA wouldn't even pay us, the FBA that is, to, to maintain and upgrade the system. Yep. So, you know, that fell to the FBA to, to continue to fund that. Uh, and, of course, that's expensive. Um, and it is, I, I agree with you totally, there's all this stuff that's going to go. And, and at the moment, the system's falling over because we don't have, we can't afford to pay two developers to keep a system going that, that is no longer seen as valuable. But the, the data's all there. Um, and ultimately, they may have to just extract the data out of the archive uh, and put it back somewhere else. Uh, and I think you're right. I think it's crucial that that happens. But I just don't know how the problem comes around unless you've got, as you say, someone like Google or Amazon or, or Microsoft to actually fund something that, that's so important. I, I, um, yeah, and, and, it, and it comes back to, to John's point. Um, data is okay, but you do need the uh, you do need the cross calibration and cross checking. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's not there's not an easy solution, but I think I think the FBA has got a role in trying to yeah. influence. Um, uh, you know, people. I mean, even even in relation to, um, for example, insurance companies and in, in, in investment about flooding and what you need to do in terms of knowing about the past to actually mitigate. Um, future problems, there's, there's got to be a novel way of influencing big companies with lots of money to actually invest as part of the sort of future in relation to um, uh, archiving and storing and this monitoring, long-term monitoring of the natural environment of which fresh water is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a key point. Because, you know, I bet your bottom dollar that at the COP conference on the, in, um, in Glasgow, data and data storage and branch specimens don't even get a mention. It's all sort of big, you know, sort of general headline stuff. And yes, we're going to do this. And it's, it's expensive. Whatever's going to happen is, is be expensive. But I think one of, the, one of the points, and again, it's part of this sort of influencing and compelling evidence to um, have the archiving aspects. Otherwise, your um, confidence of predicting the future uh, restricts is to actually invest in that um, in, in 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 the nitty gritty. And it's it's the unseen, it's the non sexy bit of of science, but it's absolutely crucial. Uh, and um, you know we we've got to find a way of doing that. And fresh water is is so crucial to um, uh, you know future political strategic geopolitical strategic stuff um, that I think a few handy politicians might need to be persuaded uh and with links into google and stuff that might do it but yeah it's a it is a problem it's what it's really worrying um that there's data loss and, and, and archive loss thanks very much for that paul and for everybody who's asked questions and stayed to the, to the bitter end um, yeah, the, the bitter beginning wasn't much good either <laughs> As I say, we got there, and I think it was a it was a great talk and really interesting discussion at the end there. Um, I think Bill's just popped a link to the FBA's data archive in the in the chat there for anybody that wants to um, to see it. Uh, I think it's environmentdata.org.uk. Um, so yeah, head along and have a look if you, if you haven't already seen that. But just once again, thank you, Paul, for that. And if um, uh, and we will have some more uh, dates for the diary coming up on the website soon, so keep an eye on that uh, in the link in that chat there as well. Great, thanks everyone.